Hello and welcome to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast, a resilience podcast where we talk about all the challenging things that we're working to overcome like anxiety, health and relationship issues. My name is Sarah. Welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited this week to dig further into pandas and pans. Uh, pandas, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infections. There are various symptoms along with this, like OCD, anxiety, tics, emotional ability, aggression, and more. We have had a number of experts come onto the podcast and do a wonderful job of explaining pandas and pans. So if you are interested, please go back, look for episodes with Dr. Scott and Alan Antoine, look for an episode with Dr. Roseanne Capana Hodge. We had Dr. Bach on in October, along with um, Dr. Jill Krista, who talked a lot about mold, but also pandas, pans. Also, an episode that focused on a homeopathic approach to pandas and pans with Dr. Jennifer Barr. And then we had some perspectives from the community. We had Gabriella True come on from Aspire, which is an organization in the U.S. that's doing great work around education and outreach. And then two parents from Canada, Richard and Marnie DeShane, also talk about their experience with pandas. So we've done a lot in this area. But one thing we haven't dug into a little bit more is alternative approaches. There have been a number of the more medical approaches. We also had Dr. Jennifer Barr come on and talk about a homeopathic approach. But today we're going to dig in a little bit more to the nutrition side of things, looking also at trauma and how trauma works in with things like pandas and pans. And I think you're going to hear a little bit more about lifestyle practices as well as supplementation and also mindset. So I think there's a lot of learning here, things that we haven't covered yet on the podcast. And so we're going to be doing all of this with our guest, Erin Darling, who is a chronic illness health coach. She is a trained nutritionist, and then also a child and youth worker. And she now works to support those with chronic health conditions naturally, including Panda's Pans. Erin is going to get into her background, her program of healing, and then also some of the methods and wisdom that she uses in working with children or young adults with pandas pans. So please enjoy this conversation with Erin Darling. Have you read my novel Pendulum by S.E. German yet? If not, what are you waiting for? And if you have, I would love to hear from you. If you don't know about Pendulum, it's a heartwarming story about a young boy who starts to experience neuropsychiatric symptoms after an infection. We follow the boy as he goes through many regular, real middle grade issues like moving, having a crush, playing sports, also while experiencing neuropsychiatric symptoms like anxiety, OCD, tics, panic attacks, and more. If you're interested in checking out Pendulum by S.E. German, it is available through Amazon Worldwide, where you can even see a preview of the book, or you can listen to chapter one, which is on episode 64 of the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. I hope you enjoy the novel, and thanks for your support. So welcome, Erin, to the podcast. I'm happy to connect with you today. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It's such an honor. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to the amazing lineup that you've had throughout the month of October. I know we're a little bit delayed in recording this as we're in November now, uh, but I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you. No, thank you so much. So why don't we get started with you providing a quick overview of your background and then how you really got interested in supporting Pandas and Pans? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll try and keep it quick. It's quite the story. Uh, It's been a really long journey to get to the place that I'm in now. And I certainly didn't start out in this field of work or really area of interest at all. 
Uh, going way back, I grew up in a really natural household. Uh, it was just me and my mom growing up. And every childhood ailment that I had was always supported naturally. So it's really ingrained in me and really just like deep in my roots to emphasize a natural approach. So I remember um, at the first sign of a sore throat, I'd be given like a honey lemon tea. I remember when I first started menstruating and I had horrible uh, cramping and, and PMS, I was brought to an energy worker. I wasn't brought to my doctor. Uh, so things were always done the natural way. And that was deep seated. Um, I, I suffered with complex chronic symptoms growing up that nobody could figure out. And my mom tried her best to support me in that natural way, but we never really came to any sort of conclusion. And I basically um, compiled a bunch of unconscious coping mechanisms to deal with chronic pain and anxiety and, you know, digestive issues and things that I just didn't understand in childhood. And I became a major overachiever. I, you know, went on to study child and youth care and, and deal with troubled uh, complex behavioral youth um, in my young adulthood. And I was working in social services, but I was seeing kids become chronically um, overdiagnosed and really malnourished. I would just reflect on my childhood and think these kids are not being supported um, in the entire way that, that I would dive in and support them. So as an empath, this was really defeating for me and, and honestly quite torturous to watch because I didn't have the power to make big changes. I remember um, I'd have closed closed door conversations with young people uh, in my office who would be on like 10 medications and emotionally numb, being referred for mental health assessments and, and such. And I would refer them to naturopaths basically under the table. I remember once I, I dropped a young person off at a mental mental health inpatient assessment center and we arrived at lunchtime and they were serving sloppy joes out of a hamburger helper packet. And there was like oh, Wonder wow. Bread and Jello. I know. I like that was a turning point for me. Um, that was a, a moment where I decided that I was done. And so I left the perceived safety of, you know, a government funded secure job and became a nutritionist to um, to heal my own symptoms, to be able to actually help these kids that I was trying to support in social services. Uh, and that's kind of how I entered the field of nutrition in general. Um, but then I became so entrenched in nutritionism that I developed an eating disorder and I became sicker mm. and sicker and sicker. And so there's many layers here, but it took years of unraveling to realize that nutrition isn't the end all be all for me and for a lot of the young people that I support. And by assuming that it is, it can sometimes do more harm. My clients would improve dramatically and then they would plateau. And so was I. I was living this parallel journey on my own um, on my own health journey. And so I ditched my nutritionist label and studied immensely in the field of alternative healing to compile my real life experience, client experience and education to create protocols that work. I should say I am not a medical doctor. I'm not a naturopathic physician. I don't heal, treat or cure. I don't replace the care of an MD. And my practice is actually very intentionally non-medical, which I'm sure I'll dive into. Mm -hmm. And so it's very complementary of some of the other things that the patient might be seeking elsewhere. Yes, absolutely. I walk alongside clients as they do pursue naturopathic care or, or medical care, but I also um, work with, with clients in isolation or outside of that box as well. So I do both. Okay, that's great. No, and I can totally identify with some of your journey. I definitely went through kind of the quote unquote nutritionism where I was, um, you know, doing what I thought and curing everything that I thought was working really well in terms of nutrition. But then, yeah, it's sort of so restrictive and I was so obsessed and, and I went down that dysfunctional eating um, realm as well. And, and so, yeah, I can see that it's, it's very hard to find that balance. Um, so why don't you talk a, a little bit about the program of healing that you are using now as a chronic illness health coach? 
Yeah, so this has unfolded really beautifully because, as I mentioned before, I studied in the field of child and youth care. So I was really used to um, supporting complex behaviors, the family dynamic, um, meeting meeting young people where they're at in order to support them rather than forcing ideals or being dogmatic. Um, so I was able to use that as, as a really nice foundation um, to my initial nutritional practice, which then grew into my complex chronic illness coaching, which is all encompassing and based basically uh, uses all of the layers that I perceive to be really important um, for, for healing these complex kinds of symptoms. So I offer a variety of support. I am the founder of the Nurture Pandas Naturally Method, which is my 12-week signature program. Um, it is, it's incredibly comprehensive. Essentially, it is three months of guided coaching. We meet once a week um, for in-depth coaching as a group. And then there's also weekly actionable modules where I provide education about root causative factors for pandas that just is missed and, you know, not discussed in conventional medicine. Um, so I provide this alternative lens or way of looking at pandas, which really looks at pandas as a symptom rather than the problem. And that's the big mental mindset shift that we do in my practice, whether it's in this 12-week program or whether it's one-on-one -on -one support that I'm providing, which is the other option that I have. Um, the program is really wonderful for parents of kids who are new to the world of alternative wellness, uh, which really should be called primary wellness, <laughs> in my opinion, mm. uh, and who want to take a hands-on approach to things like nutrition and really step into their power as their child's um, support and to help the children step into their power as their own healers. This is really, really um, profound when that shift can happen. Those who've worked with nutritionists and naturopaths and are kind of more well-versed in natural um, medicine might prefer one-on-one -on -one consultation. I see it kind of go both ways. But in this case, we, we skip the foundations that are provided in the program and we move into comprehensive care. I love, love, love using functional lab testing. So I will test the gut and hormones. I'll test for things like mycotoxins, mold. I'll look at nutrient biomarkers and, and all of these really important pieces of the puzzle when you know other approaches just haven't worked so far. So I provide kind of a whole uh, spectrum of support and typically I suggest that clients or potential clients book a free 15 minute chat so that I can steer them in the right direction. No, that sounds great. And certainly I know that you focus on chronic illness, but then you know you do sort of have this sub focus on pandas pans. And it, it, I guess, how did you get interested in pandas pans? Was it something that you just saw a need for? Or I know a lot of um, the different doctors or practitioners that I've spoken to, they either seem to know somebody with it, or how did you sort of get that focus area? So I was a child with undiagnosed pandas. And okay. that became very, uh, very clear in young adulthood as you began to unravel all of my symptoms and all of these layers. Um, but I had chronic strep in my childhood years and teen years, uh, which was compiled with Epstein-Barr virus. And we know uh, that that is often a, a link in these complex chronic illnesses and, and often in pandas pans, and then was diagnosed uh, with Lyme and, and mycotoxins and all of all of these kinds of things, but it started with pandas that was just missed. I kept being treated for strep, um, but never was treated for pandas in any any way, whether it was natural um, or more Western. I basically just my I relied on my mom and her natural support, and and we got through it. But I was never diagnosed, um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of where my passion lies. I I want to help individuals who struggled the way who struggle currently the way that I did. Um, but I want to be able to step in and provide the support that I needed when I was young. And I just, I didn't yeah. have. Yeah, I think that is really powerful in terms of being able to bring that perspective and probably really helps um, in in sort of connecting with some of the children um, or clients just generally that that are going through the the challenge of pandas pans. So thank you for sharing that. I think it's really it's helpful, really helpful context.
Oh, of course. I really believe that connection is so, so important. I focus primarily on building meaningful relationships with my clients um, because especially when we're working or when I'm working with young people, that's the most important part. They're not going to listen to some, you know, random authority figure who's stepping in to tell them what to do, especially when it's hard, especially when I'm going to say, you know, maybe gluten is a bit of a trigger uh, for what's happening for you, especially when I'm asking them to do things that involve stepping out of their peer circle, Stepping out of what feels, um, you know, developmentally normal for them, uh, relationship is primary. It's it's absolutely key. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've certainly seen that in my situation with my son is, you know, sometimes you get this advice, but then when you actually take it home to work with, it can be really challenging. So I, I can see that that would be really great for for all of your clients to make that connection. So I guess let's get into the tools a little bit further. What types of tools are you using in your practice then? Um, what kind of things have you seen a lot of success with? Yeah, so even though I no longer call myself a nutritionist, I absolutely use the power of nutrition. I believe it can be such a helpful tool. Um, I use the power of supplements, nutraceuticals, herbs, homeopathy, uh, lifestyle practices are huge. And I also outsource, I really rely on referrals to like a tight knit uh, network so that we can create the layered approach that's required uh, to have the most impact. So for instance, I love chiropractic care. I love love FSM, which is frequency specific microcurrent therapy. I love neurofeedback. I love trauma therapy, all of these things that really allow the nutritional supplemental and lifestyle uh, practices to take hold and really have that profound effect. Okay, great. I haven't heard of FSM. That's interesting. I'm writing that one down myself. I totally agree on the layered approach. Like I've often talked on the podcast about, um, you know, kind of assembling the team of experts that you really need because yeah, it isn't just just one person for sure um, with this with this challenging disorder. So that's great. Oh, totally. Like sometimes my work starts with nutrition. Sometimes it ends with nutrition. Sometimes it's the primary focus. And sometimes we don't even really touch on it at all. I really uh, believe it's important to be flexible, meet people where they are and and figure out um, how to layer these things as it all unfolds. And as a nutritionist, when I, when I was kind of identifying as a nutritionist, and that was my primary area of work, I wasn't able to do this. I would identify, you know, traumas and and nerve nervous system imbalance and all of these things, but I, I had to use nutrition and it just, it didn't always work. Yeah, no, I can totally understand that. And sometimes maybe the client's already done a certain amount of that work. And so then it can, it's not maybe making as big of a difference as, as what you'd like to see or what, um, what they kind of need to keep moving forward. Any practical tips on the nutrition side? I mean, I've shared on the podcast that we've had some recommendations about incorporating more, more like fish and vegetables in the morning, trying to heal my son's gut. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not seeing a huge difference, but I'm definitely seeing the refusal piece um, in terms of my, you know, my son's getting older, he's less amenable to some of the things that, that we're working. Mm. Um, and even vitamins, like, you know, I've, I've talked about this as well, but, you know, been doing vitamin drinks and things like that for years, um, concoctions of all the things that are, are being recommended. And, you know, there are some mornings where they're just like, no, I don't want this um, and things like that. Like, do you have any practical tips on how to get um, children on board when you are trying to make some of those challenging changes? Oh, absolutely. I feel like I could answer this question forever. We can have our, our own podcast on this question. Um, there's so many ways to look at this. I try not to be too dogmatic in my approach um, in terms of summarizing into practical tips that can get really tricky because I love to emphasize an individualized approach to care uh, mm -hmm. based on things like functional lab testing and assessment. So I don't like to ask um, you know families to super restrict if it's not absolutely necessary. And even when I do, it's for a really short period of time because I really emphasize trauma in my practice and sort of unconscious um 
mechanisms, essentially. So food restriction can be really, really hard on a young person's psyche. And, you know, I really believe in listening to our kids and following their intuition as well. So when a child doesn't want to take a supplement, I am diving deeper into that. Why? Why is that happening? Is this, you know, a, a battle between control of parent and child? Or is it, you know, just the fact that the body doesn't want this or doesn't need it, but even Mm -hmm. though it says on paper that this might be the right thing. Uh, I really believe that kids are mega intuitive, especially our picky eaters. This is an area that I love uh, working with because picky eaters often have so many messages for us about what's happening in their system based on what they will eat and what they won't. Yeah, you know what? And I've I've talked about that as well with my daughter and her food allergies is that I I kind of thought, "Oh, wow, this she's really oddly picky." And yeah, it turned out they were, you know, legit food allergies um where we needed EpiPens and things like that. So, I totally agree. And I think that's where I'm struggling. I agree with you that I the last thing I want to get towards is sort of that dysfunctional eating. And so it's been a real I think even within myself, I'm kind of like, do I push this? You know, do I not? Like he's already gluten and dairy free and feels good. Yeah, it's a really, really challenging balance because you don't want to do harm. You know, you're trying to provide support and you're trying to listen to the quote unquote experts. But um, yeah, I, I really like kind of taking that approach of, okay, it's a one-on-one piece and, you know, maybe we'll add this and maybe we won't add this because it's a problem. I think that's, that's really good advice. This is a struggle that I hear all the time. So many parents feel this way. Um, And I think that's also because of mother's intuition. Like mother really does know best as well as, you know, the child who's in their own body. Uh, But mother and child really know best. And and when there's hesitation about a protocol or things just aren't feeling right, there's always, always a reason. So I dive into that with everyone that I work with, uh, making sure that each step of the way feels really, really right. And, you know, our kids also have to fit into society. That's a piece that really... Mm is missing from nutrition and that nutritionism box. Um, we really don't, um, you know, we'll, we'll ask for gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, corn, corn-free, sorry, ketogenic, paleo. We'll like throw all these terms at families and then expect them to apply that within their yeah. real lives. But people's real lives are not always um, set up that way. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, there does become challenges along with that. Um, when you're you're trying to maybe attend a birthday party or things like that. And so that's where I kind of was like, you know, maybe we need to yeah, take a bit of a moderate approach here. It's not all or nothing. I, I have no problems with, you know, trying to incorporate a few more vegetables um, and, and fish and things like that into our our daily diet. But yeah, I do agree. I think um there's always room for sort of that middle ground, maybe. (laughs) Yes, always, always room for middle ground. And, you know, I I mean, there's some things that of course, I'm going to suggest to most people like eating organic foods, we want to avoid pesticides and heavy metals and and things like that. Um, And I really love a traditional foods approach. So I love emphasizing animal fats and proteins in their most authentic whole food form. Um, All of these kinds of things when they're accessible. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I I help families strategize how to fit that into a busy routine, how to make that accessible um, and and all sorts of ways to incorporate it. But I just I really avoid the dogmatic thinking and I really just emphasize that individual approach. That's great. So you did mention a little bit about trauma and how that fits in. I'm wondering if you can go a little bit deeper into how trauma comes into play when we're trying to uh, support Panda's Pans. Yeah, absolutely. So my passion for trauma within the context of complex chronic illness and pandas really comes from my personal experience um, in childhood. Most of my chronic health issues appeared around age 10. And that was the age that my father died. And, you know, in my teen years and even young adulthood, I couldn't piece that together. It was all very unconscious what was unfolding in my body as a result of my father's death and other things that occurred in in childhood and young adulthood. Um, But kind of after doing that um, psycho-spiritual and unconscious work, I was really able to bring to light 
a lot of the physical manifestations that I was having of the emotional trauma that I experienced. And so when I began to piece all that together, it became a huge area of interest and study and passion for me. And I've worked with hundreds of families now. I, I really have yet to see a single person, a single child, a single family who isn't dealing with some element of trauma. And that's because trauma is not about the event itself, but how the event was perceived or experienced. So just as an example, two kids fall off a bike, one kid gets back on and keeps riding. But the other is so disturbed by the experience that they never get back on. They don't get back on for the rest of the summer or maybe ever. And of course, this is just an example, but it, it also portrays how young people can have big trauma without parents even being aware that it's existing. So this is a major mislink when kids are put through the medical system, whether they've got, you know, childhood trauma that's been unidentified, whether they've got intergenerational trauma, or whether they are now, you know, undergoing medical trauma from the system that they're being put through. Mm -hmm. So when we have trauma that's playing out in our lives in all of these unconscious ways, biochemical stress compiles. And that's why trauma and complex chronic illness uh, go hand in hand. Because when the system shuts down, the accumulation of pathogens, heavy metals, you know, gut deterioration, um, cellular health deterioration, and things become prevalent. So because of this, kids who are experiencing all of this will grow up in constant fight or flight. And they lack time in the beautiful parasympathetic state, which is our rest, digest, repair state, and chronic illness um, can occur. And so how do you recognize when that is an issue or, or you're kind of maybe already said, like, it seems like it is an issue with most, most clients. It typically is with most. And the way that I um, sort of identify this is I really emphasize family work. So I get to know the family unit as a whole, and I really get to understand the dynamic and unconscious mechanisms that could be at play. And so this, um, this would be a, a really large concept to explain, but I am trained in trauma. Um, so in a more Western medical way, initially through my work in social services, but then I also started training uh, in in basically family constellation therapy or intergenerational trauma um, as well in a more holistic light. So is this something that you work with within your practice or is the trauma something that you refer out? Yes. So this is something that I emphasize in practice. I talk about trauma. I hold space for trauma. Um, it, it can unravel in many different ways within my practice, but I cannot treat it. Um, I cannot, uh, you know, put a label to it without referring out uh, to a medical professional. So I work alongside practitioners uh, as trauma unfolds. And then I support using that biochemical lens or I support, um, for instance, you know, blood sugar, which is typically really dysregulated when there's a trauma piece. So, um, you know, helping to regulate in other ways. I'm not I'm not working with a direct trauma other than holding space and, uh, you know, allowing space for storytelling and sharing and, and unraveling. That's great. And and also probably even raising it to families that this could even be an issue, right? Like I think a lot, like you said, if if parents are like, oh, well, that didn't really seem like a big deal or, or what have you, it could be something that um, they're totally missing. So that makes a lot of sense. Yes, there's always a conversation about trauma and, and how trauma manifests in the body. And then typically, um, parents will go off and kind of experience or kind of unravel some of this on their own and and things will come to light for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, just kind of on another um, issue, I guess, one of the things that I talked about a lot in October when we were doing so many episodes around Pandas Pans is Pandas Pans Awareness Day. So it's October 9th in many jurisdictions and a lot of families find it is kind of an important time to recognize each other and recognize that, you know, this disorder, these disorders are an issue that maybe aren't recognized the way they should be. And it can really help others to to see it and and for those families to feel seen and heard. And I guess I'm just wondering how you relate with the concept of Pandas Pans Awareness Day or just um, these types of awareness days in general. I really believe that community and acknowledgement and emphasis of 
the importance of coming together is critical for healing. It's critical for humankind. It's critical for prevention of, you know, these complex chronic health issues. But awareness days in general aren't something that I actually subscribe to, whether this is pandas or whether it's, um, you know, any any other kind of health ailment. I really don't subscribe to these quote unquote awareness days um, that are kind of put into place. This is because I much prefer investigation of root cause so that labels ultimately can be thrown away. Diagnosis halts investigation and it instead funds one of our biggest global industries, big pharma. And so when we promote awareness of a formal diagnosis, we stop looking deeper. We fund Band-Aid solutions, and from my perspective, it can perpetuate the stigma and shame that young people face when they are somewhat forcibly um, identifying with a health imbalance. And from my perspective and, you know, my, my lens in the work that I do, pandas is a subset of symptoms. And so identifying with a subset of symptoms can be really, really harmful um, because it stops that investigation. We stop looking into why it's happening. We medicate and, you know, outsource and we don't get to that root cause. And I feel this way um, in the pandas pans world, but also like I like I mentioned, with all Western medical diagnosis. Okay, so you're kind of seeing it across the board in terms of chronic illness. No, it's it's an interesting perspective. Um, you know, I think as a parent, it's really helped me to sort of be able to seek that connection. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting perspective in terms of the the patients and, and how that can really impact them as well. Yes. And like I mentioned, community is essential. Like we have, we have roots in our community. If we think even from a nutritional lens way back when um, community is how we broke bread, that's how we ate. That's how we, um, that's how we survived. Community is so, so important. And I don't want to uh, neglect that in, in what I'm saying at all. Um, and that's why in my program, I really emphasize community. So instead of doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, like I do in my private practice, I have community group coaching calls. I provide a free uh, platform for all of my members to stay in community together. Um, they even have like a direct chat line with each other if they want it. I have an alumni group where members stay connected and can, can connect with people from uh, who did the program during different time periods. And community is so, so, so important. I really um, am on board with you there. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I like that. I think that really is a great way to help provide people with with connections. That sounds great. Um, I guess before we start to wrap up, I'm wondering if there's any other um, tools or advice that you'd really like to leave listeners with in terms of either your program or some of your experience with chronic illness. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I'm just kind of speaking in general um, to your audience, typically parents of, of kids who are struggling and have complex chronic illness or symptoms of complex chronic illness, um, I really love to encourage parents to, to do whatever feels right uh, intuitively to take back their empowerment. Um, for the moms out there, is step into your core as that mama bear and always, always trust your gut, um, whether you're working with a practitioner or doing a lot of uh, self-healing and, and self-work, just be be that anchor in the waves as you navigate the waters of medicine and care. Um, and know that there's always support out there that's going to fit your perspective. There's, there's somebody out there um, for you, whether this is the right approach or whether it's another approach that you've heard, um, just always, always trust your gut. And so I guess another kind of sub question of that in terms of advice would be for the clients or for those experiencing pandas pans themselves, do you have any kind of lasting or, or maybe more general advice since this is something that you've experienced? I mean, I, I can see that, that it's challenging and maybe not understanding exactly what's going on for them or not knowing the future, maybe um, any advice for them? Yes. Being a warrior of complex chronic illness, I know what it's like to be in the trenches and to feel defeated, to feel like nothing's working, nobody understands. And what I would love um, to, to put out there 
is just the mindset that your body is working for you always, always, always. It's not working against you. When you have symptoms, it's giving you clues. It's giving you information, information that you can work with to step into your power and to ultimately um, heal the things that, that ail you. So just know that your body is a really miraculous system and it's, it's here to serve you. Oh, I love that because yeah, it, it sometimes does feel like that conflict, but you're right. It's, it's really sending us in the direction of what do we really need next? That's great. Um, so I guess in terms of next steps, how can listeners find out more about you and your work either online or on social media? Well, my wellness brand is called The Healthful Darling, and that's where I offer my one-on-one -on -one consultations and my signature program, The Nurture Pandas Naturally Method. Um, so all of that information is on my site, thehealthfuldarling.com. You can also follow my personal story over on my Instagram platform, which is just at The Healthful Darling. I also offer a free Facebook community called Functional Pandas Support. I'll send you the link for the show notes there, Sarah. Oh, um, and also listeners of this podcast can get 10% off my program until the end of 2021 by using code PANDAS10. Perfect. That sounds great. And I know the website has some awesome recipes. I saw some really great looking brownies and different things that we're going to try for sure. Oh, great. I'll have to know uh, what you think. I love the superfood raw cheesecake. That's my favorite. Ooh, okay. I will write that one down for sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're always looking for those things that are, you know, a little sweet, but still, you know, healthy and have great ingredients that we can still kind of get some, some nutrition from. So that sounds great. Absolutely. Especially as we enter Christmas, I love to serve things that are a little bit non-traditional when we do family gatherings. And then people are like, I can't believe that this is such and such, whether it's gluten-free or sugar-free or, you know, just made with incredibly uh, nutritious ingredients. Yeah, that's great. No, you're absolutely right. So thank you so much, Erin, for your time today. I think this has been really helpful. I appreciated understanding a little bit more about your story and your approach. And I'm sure a lot of families are going to want to get in touch with you um, to dig in a little bit further and, and find some of that help that they're looking for. Thank you so much, Sarah. This has been such a pleasure. And I'm looking forward to connecting uh, with anyone who really resonated with this episode. Are you interested in having a published author speak in your classroom or at your community event? I'd be interested in speaking about my new novel, Pendulum by S.E. German, the writing process, mental health, Pandas Pans, podcasting, and more. Contact me at reallifeprojectco at gmail.com for both in-person and online bookings. Are you looking for a way to satisfy your sweet tooth without the filler? Try Monk Pack. They make keto granola bars and keto seed and nut bars, as well as protein cookies. They come in plenty of flavors like the almond butter cocoa chip keto granola bar and the caramel sea salt keto nut and seed bar. They're great tasting. They're plant-based, gluten-free, low sugar, non-GMO, and no sugar alcohols. You can just enjoy these freely. You can go ahead and visit Monk Pack. Monk is spelled M-U-N-K-P-A-C-K dot com. And in order to get a special discount, you can use my discount code REALLIFE15, all one word, to get 15% off your order. Visit monkpack.com today to try all of these amazing low sugar products. Thank you so much to Aaron Darling for being part of the podcast this week. And I know even afterwards, Aaron and I talked about having her back possibly to dig a little bit more into like an intro to nutrition or a primer around some of the different nutritional profiles and dietary profiles that are out there and what those can be used for in terms of chronic illness. So I think that would be an awesome episode to do and I'm hoping we can do it soon. I think we learned a lot today. I really liked Erin's perspective on a number of things. I liked her explanations around the importance of nutrition, but then also how we can 
can balance things a little bit more and and what to keep in mind when we are looking into uh, natural ways to complement our healing around Panda's Pans or other chronic illness as well. Um, I think she's got a lot to offer and it's great to hear her enthusiasm around uh, working with uh, the Pandas Pans community as well as others who are struggling with chronic illness. So please do check out all of the places she mentioned, Instagram at The Healthful Darling. She mentioned her website, www.thehealthfuldarling.com, where she's got some of those great recipes that I mentioned, as well as her programs, and then the Facebook group, Fun- Functional Pandas Support. So thanks again to Erin. I hope all of you are doing well. We have been in a super cold snap. We had the snow last weekend here in Canada and then now a super duper cold time where I think even the little um, dogs and stuff don't want to go outside for their walks and it's just been a really um, pure winter time for us. So I hope everyone else is enjoying a little bit better of weather than this and that January is moving along. We will be into February before we know it, hoping at least here in Ontario that the groundhog predicts an early spring. If all of you are familiar with Groundhog Day and what what that means in North America Anyway, I hope everybody's having a great week and that you enjoyed this episode. If you do, please feel free to share it on social media. Share it with a friend maybe that you think might resonate with it. You don't have to do it broadly, but you could just um, share it over email, something like that, and help me to get some of this wonderful information out there into the hands of the people who would benefit the most. Thanks a lot and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. Please keep in mind, this podcast is not intended to be medical or professional advice. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can follow me on social media, Instagram and TikTok at Sarah Lady Gluten or Facebook, Sarah underscore Gluten Free Lady. You can also visit my website, which includes author information, speaking information, and more info on the podcast at www.se-german.com. If you like the podcast, please feel free to review the podcast on your favorite platform and also subscribe because it means that it will show up for you every week on your favorite podcast platform. Also, we've just started to have the ability to support the podcast. You can find this link in my Instagram bio or visit Kofi, K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash learning to slay the beasts. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.